Good afternoon. I wanted to thank everyone for joining us for our second edition of the virtual Frackland tour. We have a special guest with us today. We'll be broadcasting internationally to Ireland and Northern Ireland. We have Eddie Mitchell with us, who is a farmer from Ireland, and he is part of the Love Leitrim group. So please stick around, enjoy the tour, and we will take questions at the end. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Lois Bauer Bjornsson. I'm the Southwestern Pennsylvania Field Organizer with Clean Air Council, and I host Frackland Tours. Frackland Tours were implemented to help educate and give people a first-hand account of what it is like to live and grow up in the shale fields. Washington County is the most heavily frack county in our state. I grew up here, and I live here with my husband and four children. The people that you're about to meet today are just a tiny portion of the people that I work with on a daily basis, myself and family included. We are impacted residents. You will hear of our health issues, our air and water contamination, our land contamination, our land disturbances, our truck traffic, our noise traffic, and our overall decreasing quality of life that comes with living with oil and gas in our backyards. We are joined today with our partners, Dr. Ned Kattire, retired pediatrician and board member with Physicians for Social Responsibility and consultant with the Environmental Health Project of Pennsylvania, Dr. Matt Mahalik with the Breathe Project and Leanne Leiter with Earthworks. It is our hope that you will come away from the tour with a broader knowledge and understanding of what it is like to live in Frackland. If you are watching from Facebook, you can submit questions there, or if you are watching via the web, you can submit questions at info at environmentalhealthproject.org. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy the tour. Hello, my name is Matthew Mahalik. I'm the executive director of the Breathe Project. We're headquartered in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I am going to share with you some thoughts that we've put together about the context for the Ohio River Valley's regional impacts from petrochemical development. Uh, like I said, I'm with the Breathe Project. We are an umbrella organization of around 42 different other organizations working together to improve air quality in southwestern Pennsylvania. And our mission is to make sure that the Pittsburgh region and the greater Ohio River Valley has a healthy future and a sustainable future. The first thing I wanted to point out is that the Ohio River Valley is still very heavily impacted by its industrial past. And petrochemical expansion in this Ohio River Valley will add to burdens at exactly the wrong time. This image shows the US Steel Homestead Works, which at one time was the largest steel complex in the world, uh, located on the south bank of the Monongahela River uh, about six miles upstream from where the Ohio River starts. And it is iconic for what the Ohio River has been uh, throughout its past. It's served as the conveyance of some of the most industrial um, uh, products and development uh, throughout the 19th and 20th century and going into the 21st century. So I wanna talk about a couple of different uh, legacy impacts from the, uh, this industrial history. Uh, so one thing that we can note is that we still have a very serious air quality problem in the Ohio River Valley, particularly in the Pittsburgh region. So adding anything to our airshed will only make the burden worse on people in the community. The greater Pittsburgh region, which uh, includes Pittsburgh, Newcastle, Weirton, West Virginia, in the parts of Ohio, West Virginia, and Southwestern Pennsylvania, um, still continue to get very poor air quality grades. This is the report card for Allegheny County, which houses the city of Pittsburgh. And in 2020, the American Lung Association rated this region's air with straight Fs an F for ozone pollution, an F from 24 hour particle pollution, um, and an F from annual average particle pollution. 
in Beaver County, which is the location of the planned sh uh, shell ethane cracker plant, also gets poor grades. The most notable is the F grade for ozone, and the ozone is going to be the biggest impact from the emissions from the shell plant, and that's a, a concern. So not only do we have a serious air quality problem throughout the region, we still have serious water quality problems. So adding to our watershed impairments will only make things worse. Because of heavy industry and because of mining, there still are a number of toxic outflows uh, into the river system that feeds the Ohio River. Um, this is a map that was uh, produced by our uh, local NPR station uh, within a report called the Allegheny Front that showed that there are over 6,900 toxic containing wastewater discharges along the Ohio River. And it showed also that um, parts of the Ohio River uh, has, uh, in the states along the Ohio River have been doing weak enforcement of discharges into the Ohio River. And in fact, West Virginia topped the list of uh, poor enforcement where over six, 26 facilities reported exceedances greater than 100% of what the discharge permit uh, allowed uh, between the years of 20, uh, January 1st, 2016 and September 30th, 2017. And West Virginia also topped the list of places where those discharges were more than 500% of what the, um, the, the permit limit discharges were. Uh, and uh, that's over 15 facilities. And as a result, the Ohio River is consistently ranked uh, as either the most toxic or in the top list of toxic rivers in the United States. And also we still have serious land contamination problems. Adding to our land use burdens will only make things worse. So um, that leads up to the context for uh, looking very closely at health impacts from the uh, petrochemical industry. So fracked ethane will make its way to an ethane cracker plant here that's being shown to be under construction, the Shell plant uh, being built by Royal Dutch Shell in Beaver County, Pennsylvania. This is planned to be one of the largest petrochemical and plastic factories ever built anywhere. And here ethane molecules will be broken or cracked into ethylene. Once this cracker plan is completed and operational in the next couple of years, it will produce 1.8 million tons of polyethylene. The shell plant exists here because of the presence of a large number of unconventional shale gas wells that have been created in the Marcellus Shale region of southwestern Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia. The region has had an abundant reserve of ethane, uh, which is a liquid hydrocarbon used to manufacture plastics and other petrochemicals. The rapid expansion of fracking operations here uh, has presented an opportunity to petrochemical manufacturers to establish a manufacturing hub here on the, in the Ohio River Valley. It's far away from the US Gulf Coast and Cancer Alley in Louisiana, where there um, are a large number of existing petrochemical plants. And so we know what this will look like uh, by paying attention to what things already look like in places where this industry uh, operates. Um, and so Ned Kataire is going to be talking in more depth about the health impacts of the shale gas industry. My name is Dr. Ned Kataire. I'm a pediatrician and a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Council on Environmental Health. I'm a medical consultant for the Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project and a board member for Physicians for Social Responsibility Pennsylvania. I'm also a climate reality project leader. This is what fracking in Pennsylvania looks like. There are now more than 12,000 active shale gas wells in the state. Most of the activity is in Northeastern and Southwestern Pennsylvania. You can see the purple dots where the well pads are and the green dots where compressor stations push the fracked gas through pipelines. 
the yellow dots show where all the violations have occurred so far. Fracking is inherently dirty and dangerous and industry rules and government regulations can't fix that fact, especially when the precautionary principle is ignored. There is now a growing body of medical evidence highlighting the potential health harms from fracking. But even when there is scientific uncertainty regarding the links between emissions, exposure, and disease, there is still an, eth an ethical imperative to prevent harm rather than just treating it once it happens. Shale gas extraction involves drilling a hole more than a mile deep into an ancient shale formation rich in hydrocarbons, then turning the well horizontally and drilling laterally a few miles more. Once the well is established, diesel engines pump huge volumes of fresh water, sand, and chemicals into the well under enormous pressure. The high pressure cracks open the shale, and sand keeps those cracks propped open, allowing the hydrocarbons to flow up to the surface. But it's not only the hydrocarbons that come back up. Solid drill cuttings and salty corrosive brine are contaminated with fracking chemicals, heavy metals, and other earth elements from the highly radioactive Marcellus shale. Non-fuel gases like volatile organic compounds, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and hydrogen sulfide, the fumes of fossil fuels, return to the surface and contaminate the air we breathe. What comes back up in the form of solid waste gets trucked to commercial and municipal landfills where it is buried. There, toxic leachate finds its way into the area's rivers and streams where communities source their drinking water. The liquid waste, a toxic cocktail of chemicals and water-soluble radium, is disposed of in deep underground injection wells where it has been shown to contaminate water and produce earthquakes. In addition, some of the toxic wastewater is packaged and marketed to municipalities and consumers as de-icing agents and pool salts. Whole pollution is generated at every point of fracked gas infrastructure, from the teeming diesel truck traffic servicing the super well pads that hold dozens of gas wells being drilled and fracked, and from the toxic and radioactive waste that is generated at the wellhead and must be disposed of. Pipelines scar the landscape and occasionally leak and spill their contents. Compressor stations move gas along pipelines while emitting copious volumes of air pollutants like ozone forming nitrogen dioxide and volatile organic compounds. And pollution continues at shale gas refineries that process the hydrocarbons. From there, pipelines direct fracked gas to local cracker plants, as well as to LNG export terminals and distant countries with an insatiable appetite for single-use plastics. Keep in mind, all this drilling and fracking is happening near where people live and children play. The well pads and the pipelines Compressor stations and shale gas refineries are all operating around where children go to school. The Fort Cherry School District campus is now surrounded by five fracked gas well pads. The closest well pad on the left is 900 feet from this school's driveway in rural Washington County, Pennsylvania. 900 feet from the only entrance and exit into and out of the school's campus. And fracking is happening around where our children play. I don't think any parent, and certainly no pediatrician, would look at this photograph and find it acceptable in any way. Because they are growing and developing rapidly, children are more vulnerable to environmental toxics. Most of the emissions coming from fracked gas and chemical infrastructure are invisible. Hello everyone, my name is Leanne Leiter. I'm with Earthworks and I'm our Pennsylvania and Ohio field advocate. 
it can be very hard to fix a problem that you can't see. And when it comes to oil and gas development, so much of the air pollution is invisible to the unaided eye. And so that's why Earthworks partners with communities to protect their health and the climate by making visible this normally invisible air pollution. To do this, we use specialized industry standard technology called optical gas imaging cameras that detect and record these emissions from oil and gas development. This special tool shows certain gases that are emitted by the industry. It also shows the super powerful greenhouse gas methane, which contributes to harmful smog and is simultaneously fueling our climate crisis. The optical gas imaging videos that you see here are from oil and gas sites across Pennsylvania. Some of these show air pollution sources that have been permitted by state or federal agencies, and others are showing leaks that are uncontrolled and unpermitted. Earthworks travels all across Pennsylvania, the US and beyond to investigate and expose oil and gas pollution. And we see air emissions at sources from every stage of development, from the point of extraction at the wellhead to compressor stations along pipelines, processing plants, refineries, and even at old rusty abandoned wells. The images that you see here and later throughout the tour are proof that this is a dirty industry. They are also a reminder of the dangerous pollution that people on the front lines of oil and gas development are living with every day. Thank you for joining us to learn more. People who lived near fracked gas operations report many different adverse health symptoms. Sleep disruption is often the result of the nonstop truck activity, noise, and light while a well is being drilled and fracked. Headaches and throat irritation are also widely reported. Stress and anxiety are side effects of living near fracking sites. Some of these symptoms look like nuisance complaints, but for people who are exposed to fracking activities day in and day out, month in and month out, and year in and year out with the dozens of wells located on so-called super well pads, these acute symptoms of exposure and stress can become chronic medical problems. Okay, I guess we're going to start back from the beginning. We're going to go right around 2009-10 when the water got contaminated here. So the first thing we had is the water contamination on the property. We had smells and stuff coming up out of the water. I started noticing it was harder to breathe when I was in the house, but the water was running. There was breathing problems, which I couldn't understand. And then that's when all the stuff started up in the water. And we had DEP coming in here and they started you know, breaking down all the chemicals that were in the wells and our wells got disconnected. And we got put on the water buffaloes. So some of the smell changes within the house of the water went away. But in the same process, we had the compressor station start up. And so we have all the pollutants from the air, uh, the compressor stations in the air here. And that's why I was noticing the breathing problems again, nosebleeds, headaches, and it just kept getting worse. Even though industry will promise to be good neighbors, it is up to local governments and concerned citizens to ensure that public health is adequately protected when permits for new infrastructure are considered. Health impact assessment tools help communities learn about the public health impacts of different types of shale gas infrastructure, which can assist in setting protective policies in place. Health impact assessments are designed to give residents, local decision makers, and public officials enough information to determine whether or not it is safe to allow shale gas infrastructure to operate in the community. It is a structured way to bring together data about your community, the expected emissions from shale gas development, and the potential health risks posed to adults and children in the immediate area. The risks and harms of fracking are well known and well documented in the sixth edition of the Fracking Science Compendium, published in 2019 by Physicians for Social Responsibility 
and concerned health professionals of New York, a state that has successfully banned fracking. In this report, which is available online, more than 1,700 peer-reviewed studies and investigative reports found no evidence that fracking can operate without threatening public health directly or without imperiling climate stability upon which public health depends. We've learned a lot since fracking began more than a decade ago. And the evidence is now in. Fracking is a proven threat to drinking water. My name's Brian Lakanich. I reside in Deemston, Pennsylvania, Washington County. I've had fracking on my land since 2011. When they first came in, they offered me eight to $13 million. I thought I hit the lottery. I was a cheerleader for them until 2012 when I put my son into the bathtub and he came out with bleeding sores seeping on his body. Between contacting the DEP, they replaced our water. My farm has been totally destroyed and left in a shambles and nothing is done about it. The house has been fractured and the foundation is falling in. My water is undrinkable. My son has been diagnosed with asthma, headaches, and he has uncontrollable bowel movements. Myself, I got the headaches, asthma as of two years ago, neuropathy last year, and I've been repeatedly hospitalized for different things that have happened to me from consuming my water up to and including kidney failure. It's been a tragic mess down here. There was no money to be made. It's just destroyed the whole property and the company has lied to me and defrauded our family through the whole process. Our lives are totally ruined and pretty much not worth living and no one seems to want to help. Put a moratorium or completely ban them uh, from the state of Pennsylvania. The economic impact is not what they are calling. It's destroying Pennsylvania wilds. It's destroying the wildlife and it's destroying the economic backbone of Pennsylvania, which is the farming community. I believe in 2013, I counted the wells with a map that Chevron or the DEP provided me, and there was 32 wells within a square mile of me, conventional and non-conventional wells. The closest pad to me is directly to your right-hand side there, which is about uh, 150 yards. Uh, it's a rural community around here. Uh, a lot of people don't speak up. A lot of the neighbors are sick that haven't pursued anything, but in my position as being disabled and unable to work with my value of my property cut down to about 10% of what it's really worth and no ability to sell or move, I've lost just about everything and, and my son's sick now and all I can do is fight just to get out of here. I move as far away from this as possible as I can. I would hate to live, leave the state of Pennsylvania. I've lived here most of my life. I love Western Pennsylvania, but with the asthma and the sickness, we can't be anywhere around this. We have to get out of here. The evidence is in. Air pollution follows fracking because it is produced at every point of operations. Many of the chemicals used in fracking are harmful to health. Some are known to be irritating to the lungs, the gastrointestinal system, and the skin. Dozens of fracking chemicals are known to cause cancer, and many more act as endocrine disrupting chemicals that harm health. Silica dust released from sand has been shown to cause silicosis and lung cancer. VOCs are the fumes and vapors of fossil fuels, and they are an abundant component of shale gas. Benzene can cause cancer in adults and children. Exposure to other VOCs like toluene can result in permanent neurologic damage. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are another dangerous component of shale gas. 
some of these act as endocrine disrupting chemicals, which interfere with hormone functions of the body, especially the growth and neurocognitive or brain development of infants and children. In adults, exposure can lead to cancer. PM 2.5 is fine particulate matter. It is invisible, yet its damaging effects are quite large. There are abundant medical studies showing that exposure to PM 2.5 can complicate pregnancies and result in developmental disabilities in children. Chronically breathing fine particulate pollution can cause sickness and death from heart attacks, strokes, and chronic diseases like COPD. It worsens asthma in children. Breathing PM 2.5 is known to cause lung cancer and bladder cancer, and it is, it is linked to other types of cancer in adults. Carbon monoxide from diesel exhaust on and off well pads is toxic to every human who breathes it. Carbon dioxide is the principal greenhouse gas responsible for global warming and climate change. Nitrogen oxide pollution occurs at every point of shale gas development, especially at compressor stations. Abundant nitrogen oxides combined with abundant volatile organic compounds in the presence of heat and sunlight to form ground level ozone, which damages every person's lung function. The Marcellus shale is highly radioactive. Radon gas has been shown to collect in basements and crawl spaces in homes near fracked gas wells. Radon is the leading cause of lung cancer in non-smokers. Finally, large volumes of methane leak inadvertently and are vented on purpose into the atmosphere during fracking operations. Because methane is an extremely potent greenhouse gas, trapping heat in the atmosphere 86 times more effectively than carbon dioxide over a 20 year time frame. Fracking is a disaster for the planet's climate system. Fracking accelerates climate change. The evidence is in. We know that living near fracking operations where all that pollution exists raises the risks for pregnant women. Low birth weights, prematurity and birth defects are all outcomes associated with pregnant women living in proximity to shale gas wells. The consequences of some of these impacts persist throughout the course of a child's life. The evidence is in. Living near fracking sites has been linked to asthma, rashes, headaches, and unfortunately, cancer. From 2008 to 2018, in four heavily fracked counties in southwestern Pennsylvania, two Pittsburgh area journalists uncovered 27 cases of Ewing sarcoma, a very rare and frequently fatal bone cancer of children, and 40 cases of other rare cancers for a total of 67 rare cancers in children, teenagers, and young adults. In Washington County, Pennsylvania, a mostly rural and suburban area just south of Pittsburgh, six cases of Ewing sarcoma and 30 other rare childhood cancers were counted. These numbers are far more than would be expected to occur in a similarly populated area over a 10 year period. And new cases keep popping up in this region. Parents and physicians are very concerned that pollution and toxic waste from fracking operations may be to blame for this outbreak of rare childhood cancers. Medical and epidemiological studies are now underway in Pennsylvania that may confirm or refute this plausible concern, especially since at least 55 chemicals used in fracking are known to be carcinogenic. In the meantime, real pain is being felt by these close-knit communities and by parents who have lost loved ones. My name is Janice Blanoff. My son Luke passed away August 7th of 2016. He was a healthy young teenage boy playing basketball and woke up in the middle of the night on Thanksgiving break with excruciating pain and numbness um, in his legs. 
they diagnosed him with um, Ewing sarcoma, so a rare form of cancer. It was in his um, lower spine, and they said they had to do emergency surgery to remove it because that was the only thing that would take away his pain. Um, so within the next day or so, they did the surgery, and he was released. But um, we knew we had a long road ahead of us. He was going to have chemotherapy and radiation, and uh, his treatments, he was treated on and off through Children's Hospital, um, Cleveland Clinic, and um, MD Anderson Hospital in Houston, Texas, um, where he also had a limb salvage surgery. They removed part of his hip and femur. In our close neighborhood, in our church, there was a young fellow that we prayed for for years at Mass every weekend. And... I didn't realize at the time that we were praying for a boy who had Ewing sarcoma. Um, and then whenever Luke was diagnosed, I met a mom at Children's Hospital who had lost her son to Ewing sarcoma who lived a mile or so up the road. So there were three, three of us now, Curtis, Kyle, and Luke. Um, so it wasn't really until Luke's friend and classmate from Canna McMillan High School was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma that I thought something is very wrong here with this picture because we're all <laughs> in this close-knit community um, and, and it's supposedly such a rare cancer, so what the heck is going on? But also in the bigger area where you have Washington County, Green, Fayette, um, there are 28 cases of Ewing sarcoma. To me, that's not rare. I'm sorry. I don't agree with their analogy of throw a handful of pennies up and, and some are going to cluster together. The more that I've come to learn about fracking and the process, um, I kind of just have to believe that there's something it's related to that somehow, some way. I mean, you, you you figure, and I'm learning that, you know, what is in the shale is radioactive material. And we're taking it out of there and we're bringing it up to where we are. It's in our water. It's in our soil. It's in the air we breathe. So I just, um, I'm just having a hard time believing that it's not because of fracking that I lost my son. And to think of all the young people, um, you know, I have children and grandchildren that I worry about their future because if it's this bad now, it can only get worse. That's frightening. The evidence is in. Fracking brings noise pollution, light pollution, and stress. People living in communities with shale gas development report high levels of stress. The noise, the odors, the bright lights at night, and the heavy diesel traffic can lead to sleep deprivation, headaches, and stress. Crime, drug and alcohol abuse, sex trafficking, and sexually transmitted infections occur at higher rates where fracking occurs.
Fracking jobs are killing jobs. They are some of the most dangerous jobs in America. Workers who are exposed to air pollution, chemicals, and radiation may not have the personal protective equipment and training to protect themselves and their families from harm. I got tired of all the lies out of DEP. So I got a job driving a water truck because I wanted to find out what was really going on on these drill pads. And when I first started out with them, I was only doing you know, fresh water. And I noticed after a few weeks being on the frag sites, I started getting these severe rashes on my elbows. And other drivers were talking about the same thing. You know, they were getting these rashes on their elbows and everything else on the arms. And a lot of these chemicals they were putting into the tanks, it was on the ground, basically were standing in it, breathing it, you know, the silk of dust and everything else. Then, you know, your boots started leaking and everything else, and your feet were getting wet. And that's when we started getting the rashes on our feet and on our legs, which I still have, you know, rashes up my legs and staining, you know, I call it staining because it's like permanently stained mm -hmm. into my feet and legs. The breathing problem has always been there. The nosebleeds, the migraine headaches, you know, and I did this, you know, 2010, 11, and 12, I was driving, you know, the water trucks. And finally, I, I just quit. I just, I found out what I wanted to find out, and, you know, the spills and the contamination and every stupid thing you can think about doing in this, we've done. The money wasn't worth my life, and I just, I was getting sicker and sicker, so I just, I quit. But while I was driving the truck, one of the other things I got like this huge lump on my arm, and I didn't know where that came from. That was shortly right after the stuff with the elbows. But I slipped on the ice and broke my back in three places. And then when I got put to the hospital, they had me in the uh, in the machine there. They had it in there, and they were, they were scanning my body, you know, to find out where the brakes were in my back. And I got these doctors standing there going, uh oh, uh oh. Oh my. And they came in and these other doctors came in and said, we're sending you these uh, cancer doctors. We've noticed these masses. So next thing I know, they're putting me in for surgery and there was a tumor on the side of my arm. And this one was hooked to one that was on the top of my heart. You know, I've gone through seven cancer surgeries in the past year and a half. I still remember hearing the drill, drilling in the side of my head. I still have nightmares over that. Uh, you know, last screening, you know, I'm still cancer free, thank God. I don't want to go through any more surgeries. I'm still trying to recover from them all. But these are the things that happened to me. I know other workers that have the same things happen to them. Pipelines leak, corrode, spill, explode, injure, kill, and prompt evacuations. Water contamination is a danger for many who live along pipeline routes, such as the Mariner East 2 pipeline that runs through Pennsylvania. Hi. My name is Erica Tarr. I live in Glen Mills, Pennsylvania, and my family has been impacted by a contaminated water supply. The Mariner East 2 pipeline is being installed across the state of Pennsylvania by Sunoco, partnered with Energy Transfer to transport natural gas liquids. There was a spill in June at the pipeline drill site behind our property, which resulted in the township issuing notices of violation to the company installing the pipeline. The, the company continued to work and to clean up after that spill, using back trucks sucking enormous amounts of water from underground, and this went on for several weeks. During this cleanup, our water turned brown and progressively worsened, and the pressure dropped. Our water quality got so bad that we needed to treat it by installing new equipment. When we went to install the equipment, we discovered that our well had run dry. Our only option was to drill a new well as public water is not available where we live. 
We drilled a new well and shortly after realized that there was something wrong with our new water supply. There was a strange odor to the water and my daughter got sick after bathing in it. At that time, we stopped using the water and sent water samples for testing. While we waited for the results, we started our new daily routine of packing up the car with our dirty dishes and laundry to drive to our family members' houses to use their washer and dryer and shower. We couldn't use the water in our home to wash our hands or to brush our teeth. We relied on hand sanitizer and bottled water to rinse our toothbrushes. The water test revealed that our new well was contaminated with toluene and MTBE, two volatile organic compounds that are found in jet fuel. After doing research, we discovered that a Sunoco pipeline ruptured in 1992, leaking tens of thousands of gallons of jet fuel on the property behind ours, and that spill was not completely remediated or cleaned up. The new pipeline that is being drilled is being installed in the same right of way where the Sunoco pipeline ruptured in 1992. They are drilling directly through the contaminated property and remediation site. Since this whole water crisis began, I have learned how to read water tests and analyze the results. I've spent countless hours researching previous leak site documents and finding the link between the contaminants back then and the contaminants that we are testing for in our new well. I'm not a chemist or an attorney. I'm a nurse who recognized a correlation between my daughter bathing in the water and becoming ill. I promised from that moment on that I would fight to get the clean water that my family needs and deserves. After installing tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment to treat the contaminated water and having the equipment fail within weeks, we were brought back to the reality that we can't just live forever with contaminated water supply that we're supposed to treat and be okay with living with that. Post-treatment, the jet fuel contaminants were being removed. However, the equipment was still allowing some solids and metals to get through the filtration system. Our brother-in-law installed a makeshift buffalo or water tank in our garage that bypasses our well. He has been delivering his public water from his house twice a week using a truck with the same size water tank on the back of the pickup. He fills the tank at his house, hosing public water from his own home into the tank, then drives it to our house to pump the water into the buffalo. The water buffalo only holds 300 gallons and the average adult uses 80 to 100 gallons of water per day. We have learned to conserve the water and only use it for showering, washing our hands and brushing our teeth. We are still doing laundry at our family members' homes to help us conserve the water buffalo. Through this whole ordeal, we have learned that we took clean water for granted. Relying on our brother-in-law to fill the buffalo every three days, it's just a Band-Aid and it's not sustainable. Water is a basic human right and we desperately need a permanent water solution. Our water buffalo is not an endless supply of water. We're consciously thinking about how much water we're using, whether it's 15 to 20 gallons to shower or three to five gallons every time we flush the toilet or 20 to 25 gallons when you do the dishes. It's constantly on our mind. We can't just walk outside and water our lawn or water our plants or power wash our house. We can't fill the baby pool or the water table for my daughter to play with. We've resorted to showering our toddler because it uses much less water than bathing her would. We don't have a solution, but this is how we've learned to live. Thank you for coming here for our update. Um, we appreciate all the support that we've gotten through this and we appreciate you watching. Fracking hurts all of us, but there are some of us who face higher risks from this highly industrial and polluting activity. Pregnant women and fetuses are at risk for developing complications of pregnancy and poor fetal health outcomes. The health risk to infants and children living near shale gas development is especially concerning due to the fact that their behaviors and interactions with the environment increase their chances of exposure to toxic chemicals and because children's bodies grow and develop rapidly, making their organs more susceptible to damage from toxic exposures. Older people and those with limited financial resources are also at risk. 
People of color often live in environmental justice zones, close to polluting industries like this one. Residents living in proximity to shale gas development who have chronic medical conditions like chronic lung disease, heart disease, and children with asthma are more at risk for having exacerbations of those diseases. Industry workers are of course at high risk of acute industry, exposure, and illness. Workers and athletes who spend a lot of time outdoors breathing polluted air are more vulnerable. And we shouldn't forget our first responders. In the US, the shale gas industry is not legally required to disclose what chemicals are being used in fracking operations. This secrecy puts first responders at a disadvantage when called to respond to an emergency, and it puts their health and safety in danger. I worked in the coal, coal industry for 41 years. I worked underground. I uh, worked in an environment that wasn't very pleasant. I, I breathe the coal dust. I worry about black lung, which supposedly I have a touch of it, something I have to watch out for the rest of my life. And I surely don't want to be breathing any type of emissions from the gas and oil pads that we've been enduring in the last few years since it's been put in production. It was real quiet until the industry moved in and I don't know, they rocked us, you know, you know, 50, 60 trucks a day up and down the road using as a haul road that once was just a road, that, a red dog road that you would see one, one or two neighbors max for the day. I've lived basically on this property in this area for over 50 years. And until this plant and comp compressor stations were put back there, it was a nice quiet area to live. My brother-in-law lived right in that house down there. Never that smoked, never drank. Three years ago, he died of lung cancer and liver cancer. Now, in November, I was diagnosed with throat cancer. They've had Geiger counters on these trucks coming in with anywhere from 2,500 to 8,200 Picuries of radiation that they're dumping in just regular dumps. The used brine water, the used um, fracking fluids all mixed in with it. Anything else they're pulling out of the earth, plutonium, lead, radiation, plus the silica dust from them drillings in the air and in everything. People up the road, a couple people up the road are sick from the twilight compressor station. Yeah, my friend that lives on the next road, up on the next road, Woodland Road, parallels that, he's sick as hell. But everybody up on that hill's sick. Uh, we had an incident, I think, in a county adjoining us um, back in like 2015 where a well pad, well head was ignited and they first responders were not able to get within 750 feet of that well head burning. And my house is only 550 feet away. I'd say it would not be a very good thing. Um, it's just stuff that needs to be considered and it's not being considered. I've had spills on the road and they came by at night, you know, with water trucks and big road brooms and brushed it and hosed it on the people's land. We were unable to stop them from destroying the Osage orange trees that were across there as, as a wind block. They tore down several hundred feet of them simply because we did not have the money to put a, a stop to that through the courts. I am wondering, I just went for a cancer checkup and there is some something showing on my lungs. And I know one time when I was sleeping, the it was an awful odor coming in to my house and it woke me up, it was so bad. You don't know. It's like uh, other people, they say their animals got sick and so on. Well, I don't have animals, so I don't know whether I'm the guinea pig or not. <laughs> Everything that they have, everything that they do is written so that you don't have a leg to stand on. They'll say that everything is fine. They'll say that everything is for you, that they have your best interests at heart. But if you try and stop them, then you become their enemy 
and they will do everything to get around you. Uh, what we're saying is that the Ohio River Valley is still heavily impacted by its industrial past. Uh, petrochemical expansion will only add to these burdens at exactly the wrong time. One key message here is that we've been down this road before. We should know better than to embrace uh, an industry like petrochemicals uh, because we have spent 30 or 40 years trying to move away from that legacy. Um, and so uh, this is again that photograph of the US Steel Homestead Works. One of the things that occurred when the steel industry collapsed in the 1980s was that it had a very serious uh, social impact on the community. Not only were communities left with a toxic legacy to clean up and buildings and infrastructure that were abandoned by industry, um, but it also resulted in heavy unemployment um, and uh, disruption of families. And so we should know better uh, and our regional cultures have tried to set things up to adapt. Um, and so pet petrochemicals will be um, making that difficult once again for us. And history is uh, uh, resplendent with stories of past cultures that undermine themselves because they did not manage their environment and their health. So the future really is in our hands. Do we want to embrace something like plastic for the future or do we want something else that is a more health sustaining, life sustaining and um, more stable economic future for our region? And so um, that's what um, we are trying to change the narrative on that. And the Breathe Project is committed to healing the past and also setting things uh, on a proper path for the future, for a healthier future for all of the Ohio River Valley. I hope this introduction has been useful uh, to everyone. And we look forward to seeing you in the second version or, or the second series of this webinar sequence um, where we talk about some of the other dimensions of the industry beyond health. Thank you very much for being with us today. And we look forward to further dialogue with everyone. And this is my contact information where I'm happy to engage with people who are interested in learning more about this work and how they can be engaged. Thank you very much and enjoy the day. Lois, coming to you. Hello, thank you so much for joining us on uh, our Frackland tour. We uh, are looking forward to taking any questions that you may have, so please. Uh, we have a wonderful group of ex experts with us, um, and we would love to uh, answer your questions. So we're going to turn this over to Laura Dagley and Tammy Murphy, um, who have been fielding our questions, and uh, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on uh, our Frackland tour. We uh, are oh, looking forward to taking any questions. That you may have. All right. Um, I'll go first. We got our first question here um, for Dr. Nick Kattire. Um And the question is, uh, what does this pollution do to our immune systems? And is it possible that fracking pollution is related to autoimmune disorders? Well, <laughs> over uh, 170 chemicals uh, are used in the fracking process. I mentioned earlier that uh, several dozen uh, are known to cause cancer, uh, but of the remainder of chemicals, uh, some of them act as endocrine disrupting chemicals. Uh, others are very irritating to the skin, to the respiratory tract and the digestive tract. Uh, they're, they're very uh, toxic and they affect every organ system and body system uh, that uh, keep us healthy. Uh, and that includes the immune system. Uh, the endocrine disrupting chemicals, which interfere with the hormonal function in the body, um, also are uh, active uh, in keeping your immune system healthy. So these uh, chemicals indeed can impact the immune system. Uh, 
Thank you so much. Um, our second question is actually for Eddie Mitchell. Um, and this is, uh, the question is, how can communities like ours, this is um, coming from either Ireland or Northern Ireland, how can communities like ours work together most effectively against this industry? Um, hi, I think um, we, we're all affected communities. Um, you're further down the line than, than we are, or where we were in, 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 the, in the Republic of Ireland. Um, we, when we started our campaigns here, we were listening to personal testimony. And I'm just listening there to Janice Blanock there talking about you know, the reality of, 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 of what she's facing. We, we don't want to face that in Ireland. Um, so I think we, we, we have to connect. So we have to um, imagine that you're next door to us now. Um, we, we, I think you need us, but we also need your, your, your testimony. We need to know what's happening in your communities. Um, we need not to buy frack gas from Pennsylvania. That's really important. And I think we're going to do that in the Republic of Ireland. We're going to, 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 to ban the, 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 the trade in, in, in fracked LNG. But also we're, we have to go into Northern Ireland and we have to complete the job that we started in 2017 and ban fracking in Northern Ireland. Um, but we're, we're all going to work together. I mean, I don't know if you realise how much we relied on ye, um, you know, coming up to 2017, listening to people like Theo Colburn talking about the, the risks, you know, the, the public health. But um, we just need to keep working together. And I, I thank you very much for, for what you're doing and all, the, and all the help that you're giving us. It means an awful lot to us over here. Thank you very much. The next question. Okay, um, the next question is for Leanne. Um, so it's asking about what is the difference of the emissions coming from upstream compressor pump stations versus downstream facilities, which are the export terminals? Um, can we chemically characterize the entire frac to plastic chain? And how would you suggest we could initiate these studies? That's a, a great um, question. And I, I love anyone that's interested in learning uh, more about the data because I am always interested in that as well. I think the best way to answer the question with the short time that we have is to, to really make clear that um, from what we found with our work in the field, um, and with many other studies is that there is the potential for air emissions at every part of the supply chain. So we're seeing uh, emissions from the wellhead, you know, the point of extraction, we're seeing emissions um, as the gas is being processed. I live about three miles from a very large um, processing and cryogenic facility operated by Mark West. Um, so we're seeing the emissions there. We're seeing them as they're being transported through compressor stations at pipelines. Um, and there are even studies um, that have recently been coming out showing that there are dangerous emissions from the household use of uh, fracked gas uh, when it's coming out of your stovetop or in your water heater. Uh, so we do know that this pollution is all along the line. In terms of the, the differences of what comes out at each point, um, I, I think some of that information is available. I know um, Dr. Kataier's group, the Environmental Health Project, has done some really interesting work on the emissions levels um, of different types of pollutants from different parts of the, the upstream and downstream um, system. Um, but I think we probably won't be able to get into the great detail on those today. So I'm happy to um, share my contact information if we can maybe put it in the chat um, and can try to answer those questions in more detail offline. Great, thank you Leanne for that, uh, for your answer. Um, along a, a similar, similarly along the um, same lines of what you were saying about how the emissions is um, detectable all, um, all along the industry, um, from you know, extraction um, throughout the infrastructure um, process, moving the gas along, and then in the end product, such as a power plant or an LNG. Um, Melissa, can you um, look at that entire process? Um, and I know we have just a short amount of time, but can you discuss the radioactivity um, 
how it, how it is also detectable throughout that process? Well, um, I'm going to follow Leanne's lead and give the short answer, but it is quite long and detailed, actually, the different types of radioactivity and the, the pathways of exposure at each piece of um, the extract production um, and uh, transmission and then to the whole cradle to grave picture of shale gas um, and oil. There, the industry itself has known for a very long time um, that the entire industry is radioactive. And I want to point to um, a friend of mine's work. His name's Justin Noble, and he wrote a piece in Rolling Stone earlier this year called America's Radioactive Secret. And in that article, um, which I highly suggest everyone reads, it goes into this in a lot of detail um, and also recounts the, the cases that are now being won in the United States um, on behalf of oil and gas workers who've been ex who have been exposed to this over the course of their tenure and um, are now suffering from cancer. Some of them have already passed. Um, so yeah, the short answer is from the wellhead to the uh, where this material is brought up out of the ground, all the way through the streaming process, compressor stations produce radioactive waste, ethane cracker facilities produce radioactive waste anywhere. Radioactivity is carried along with shale gas and oil. So is it at an LNG export facility? And you can answer that as simply, as asking another question, is there shale gas at that facility? If so, then there's radioactivity. Thank you, that was an excellent answer. Okay, I think that's all the questions um, coming from our end. Actually, I have another question here for Eddie. I'm sorry, something just came in. If you give me a second here. Um, okay. Um, so Eddie, there's a question here um, for folks that uh, are wondering about communities that don't live nearby um, any infrastructure like this, um, or maybe who are not experiencing this yet um, and they want to know how they can get involved in campaigns against fracking and how uh, we can widen our alliances. I suppose um, our experience of that is the way that we moved from a local campaign in the west of Ireland and um, dealing with fracking to having a national campaign against um, frac gas imports. So like, um, so there's room for everybody. These are very big campaigns. Um, I think what Friends of the Earth in, have done a lot in Dublin, not here, not anywhere, um, safety before LNG. If you could help some of those groups, lovely from our own group um, in the north, um, Bell Crew, um, Frack Free, um, there's Uplift in Northern Ireland. There's, you know, other people will talk more later. We all have to join together. For people that aren't affected, like communities, this is a huge issue as well, also for climate. I mean, we know that methane is accelerating methane leakage is accelerating climate change. So, you know, we this just can't be allowed to happen. And the evidence is there to support that. So um, the work that you're doing brings this to the attention from the person, from the public health point of view, but everybody has an interest in this um, from, from, from the climate perspective. So I just encourage people to, to find us and help us, you know, join, join us. Thank, Thank you, Eddie. So we appreciate you um, being able to join us for the tour today and everyone in Ireland and Northern Ireland. And we were more than willing to help. Thank you very much. And I wanted to just thank everyone else that's on the panel. Um, it's an excellent group of people. Um, this is a tremendous amount of work 
And uh, I can't thank you enough uh, for everything that you do. And uh, lastly, though, I'd like to thank all the impacted residents that I work with on a daily basis. Um, without them and without them telling their stories, uh, this would not come to light. So thank you again for joining us for the tour and uh, we will see you soon.